it's it's been a slightly uh, hectic 24 hours. And my um, uh, my wife has been is diagnosed with, uh, with COVID, um, so I'm working from the house now. I'm I'm in bidud, um, all sorts of things. I'm the uh, as part of the one of the um, fallouts for this is that the shiur that I was planning on teaching. Um, and I was in the midst of preparing, so I didn't quite finish the preparation. It's something that well, I was planning on speaking about the... Slicha, I can tell you something. Okay, great. And then I'll just hold it like this. Um, the, so here, the, um, so this is a, a shiur that uh, the, the actual topic that I wanted to speak about was the um, authority of uh, Torah and mitzvot before Matan Torah. Um, and I will hopefully return to that topic at a later shiur. Um, unfortunately, because of things going on today, uh, not today, this whole week, um, I was unable to finish the, uh, the preparation for it. So this is a, uh, um, a, a rerun, as it were, from a few years ago, I gave this shiur. If those people who remember it, hopefully it'll be good chazara for those people who either weren't there or don't remember it, so um, it'll be the first time. The, um, the the topic that I want to speak about today, coming from this week's parsha, as you can see from the um, the screen in front of you, is the question of um, when you uh, is the, the question of how important is intent when an avera is um, is perpetrated. Um, so if we look at this week's parsha, um, so in several instances already in last week's parsha, when um, Yosef uh, tries to comfort or at least alleviate the, uh, the distress of the brothers, um, he returns to a theme again and again. And the question is whether that is just simply a person being um, diplomatic, uh, forgiving, uh, looking towards a, uh, a better future with his family, or is that uh, reflect a, a legal uh, reality? That's really the, uh, the question I want to focus on. Um, so let's take a look at the Parsha and some of the Mepharshim on the Parsha, and then go from there to a halachic discourse. Um, the question with regard to um, the Parsha. So if we take a look at the we have the. Um, the sound is not good. Um, we can have you the, enlarge, the. Sorry, can you enlarge the type in any way? Because it's very small. Oh, that's getting better. Everybody can magnify it in, in your panel. You can see view options. Okay. Um, okay. So. Um, so now, one second, let me just, um, so the, um, so the psukim here, right, you have towards the end of the parsha after Yaakov has passed away um, and the brothers, um, which is another um, question, uh, are the brothers telling the truth when they tell him that um, Yaakov uh, had commanded uh, him through them to tell them to tell him that they sh he should not take revenge. Um, so it's a question of whether that's the truth, and it's a question of whether you can speak um, falsehoods under those circumstances. That's another shiur um, that we've actually spoken about in the past. Here, Yosef's reaction is what I want to focus on. Yomer alehem Yosef al tirau ki atachat elokim ani. So it's really a question. Is that you know Yosef says, "Do not fear." Am I um, am I in place of God? So the um, you indeed perhaps had uh, thought of, had decided to do this for the uh, uh, for the ill, but God intended it for the good, and all of and all's well that ends well in effect. Leman amrav. In order that what we have the situation today, remember this is 17 years after 
they had come to Egypt. The famine is long over. Um, and at this point, the, uh, the original reason that Yosef had given to them back in uh, last week's Parsha, in Parshat Vayigash, of saying that God had said to me here in order to, um, in order to support the family during the time of the famine, that's no longer applicable. That's why he says here that the reason for it is, is that in order to support a large nation and to create a nation, um, it's interesting, and I'll just say this as an aside, Yosef never mentions the reason that we think of in terms of why the uh, Yosef was sent down in order to create a uh, Shibud Mitzrayim in terms of, in terms of fulfilling the Brit Ben Habitarim. Um, Yosef never mentions it. There's no reason to think that the Brit Ben Habitarim and the promise to Avraham was necessarily known to subsequent generations. In fact, it could very well be that Avraham kept it to himself. And um, or or Yitzchak kept it to himself wherever it ended, um, and the brothers had no idea that this was something that was around the corner. Um, so that's why he says La Chayot Amrav. Be that as it may. Getting back to the first half of the pasuk, Elokim Chashavah Tova. So the Rashbam says the following: Hakadosh Baruch Hu Garam Lachem. I'm in source number two. Va'atem Lo Pashatem. Very interesting. Um, uh, way that he, uh, the, the way that he's understanding this, atem lo pashatem, right? You did nothing wrong. Ki um, nitkaven All of this was intended for the the greater good, and since it was great for the greater good, there is no um, culpability. The svarno um, takes it. Uh, another step, and he says the following, what you did was unintentional. Right? To be why was it unintentional? Because after all, they do full well what they were doing when they threw him into the pit. The reason why it was shkaga was because, and this is um, one might argue is not necessarily the case, but they, according to the Svarno at least, the, the brothers saw Yosef as a legitimate threat. If I indeed were a Rodef, if I indeed were someone who was trying to push the other brothers aside, so then what you did would have been justified. So Elokim Chashava Tova, Himtzil Bachem Zot Hashkaga L'Tachlit Tov. No, since your intent was unintentional, even though they wanted to harm Yosef, but because the underpinnings of that harm were legitimate, so God twisted it and flipped it into a way which would be for the good. Um, so again whether you're the Rashbam, whether you're the Svarno, the idea of Atem Elokim Chashava Tova seems to be um, pretty, um, uh, pretty solid in terms of absolving the brothers from blame. Um, the the uh, Orachayim says something uh, even perhaps even beyond that. The Atem Chashavtem Vagomer, Elokim Chashavala Tova, Vahare Zed Dome, Limit Kaven, Lahashkot Chavero Kos Mavet. So it's as though you're intending on um, giving your fellow a cup of poison. Vihishkiu Kos Yain, Sheino Mit Chayev Klum. Now, what the reason why I say this is taking it even Further is because um, the Rashbam, if you if we take, started by saying Hakadosh Baruch Hu Garam Lachem, which is an interesting formulation. The basically what the Rashbam wants to claim was that the brothers at that moment had lost um, uh, their bechirach of shit, as it were. 
words, God was pulling the strings and God sent um, Yosef to them and intended for them to, uh, to sell him in order to play out the, uh, the scenario that we're familiar with. The Orachayim doesn't even, say, and of course the Sfarno says that their original um, thinking was, um, was legitimate. It was, wasn't even that God had, um, had done this to them, right? the, but rather the, um, th- they judged Yosef and based on the information that they had at their disposal at the time, it was a legitimate uh, ruling. It just happened to be a wrong ruling. Um, and that's why they are off the hook. But here, it's the, the Orachayim is saying that this is domel mit kaven lahashkot chavero kos mavet. You are, um, you're handing someone deliberately poison. Um, and yet, the hishkel kos yayin, and the, um, what you do instead was, uh, was, uh, was totally unintentional, wasn't something that you were uh, thinking about at all. She'eno mitchayev klum. Whereas there's, there isn't any uh, turn here, the Orchaim, to um, a legitimate legal decision that they made. There isn't any turn to God being involved. They are criminals. It's attempted murder. And yet, attempted murder, he's saying, if, you, uh, if it doesn't work out, no mitchayev klum, no culpability. Right? There's no culpability whatsoever. Veharehem turim v'zakaim gam bidine shamayim. The the orachayim really makes a um, a remarkable claim that even if I have if I commit attempted murder, that is not a crime. So that is a um, something that we're going to now examine as to um, the. Um, uh, 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 whether this holds up halakhically. Um Okay, so just to answer Stephen's question in terms of how was he um, uh, a rodef, so that is a you know a larger question going back to Vayesha to see how the Sforno understands it. But basically, as I recall, because I it's been a while since I looked at uh, at the parish, but as basically was to say that he was. Um, the, the way they viewed it was through his dreams and um, his overall um, behavior, he was acting in a way um, which was, in effect, similar to the way that uh, the, um, uh, what had occurred to Esav, what had occurred to Yishmael, um, etc. And so their feeling was that he, had, um, he was threatening the family and um, and he was able. They were uh, able to. Um, uh, they were able to judge him the way that they did. Um, in in any event, now let's uh, look at the. Um, uh, let's look at the halachic discourse here. The Gemara in Nazir. It actually appears uh, several times. We're looking at source number five, the Gemara in Nazir um, says the following, with regard to the pasuk. Um, of Isha Haferam Vahashem Yislachla. When a uh, woman makes a vow, takes a neder, um, so there is the, the right of, the, uh, of her husband, Isha, her man, um, to annul that uh, vow. Now, that has, uh, there are many halachot attached to it and limitations to that in terms of when the husband has that right. Um, is it? Is it certainly not every uh, vow that a, a woman makes, etc. But it, but there are those vows that that is a given right um, with the, with with limitations in terms of his right to annul as well that he uh, is able to do so. And then the Torah says Hashem Yislachla, and God will forgive her. So the Gemara says the following, or it's the Brita: Biisha shehefer la baala. This is dealing with a situation where the husband annuls the vow without the woman's knowledge. So it's not a situation 
where the uh, it's not a situation where the the woman is um, um, the woman hears her husband canceling her vow, but rather the woman makes a vow, her husband hears it, he says that vow is negated. And now she nevertheless requires um, some kind of forgiveness, some kind of slicha, some kind of kapara, some kind of atonement. Because it says Hashem Yislachla. In other words, the 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 assumption here is that she violated, and we're going to see this uh, in a moment in what Rabbi Akiva says. You know what? Instead of saying see in a moment, let's see what Rabbi Akiva says. When Rabbi Akiva would read this pasuk and understand it the way I just mentioned, he would cry. Why? So he does the following. What must have been the scenario? If a woman makes a vow, or any person makes a vow, and then doesn't violate the vow, so there's no need for kapara. There's no need for Hashem to be soleach. I, uh, I fulfilled my vow, or I didn't violate it, if it's something in the negative. Um, I say that I'm not going to, uh, you know, I'm not going to uh, uh, eat cheesecake anymore. I'm on a diet. I make a netter of that regard. And I never eat cheesecake. So there's no need for a, um, for, for kapara. I made a netter. I fulfilled the netter. It must be that in this situation, she violated her neder. She said whatever she said, right? We'll say cheesecake. I don't know. That probably, by the way, isn't the neder that a husband can, buy, can uh, annul. But she makes the neder. Her husband says, okay, I know that the, uh, you know, uh, I'm, go- I'm going to annul this vow. Right? I, she doesn't have to keep to this diet. And then the woman eats the cheesecake. Now, she didn't violate anything because there was no vow to be violated. Her husband had annulled it. But she didn't know that. So that's the equivalent of what Rabbi Akiva says, is that she took something which she thought was forbidden. She's taking basar chazir, or she thinks it is. But it's really lamb chops. And she eats a lamb chop. So the Torah is saying that for intent, for sin, there is a need for slicha and kapara. Um, uh, and, and all the more so if your intent is fulfilled. If you wanted to eat a pork chop and you ate a pork chop, so of course then you're going to need slicha and kapara. But even if you wanted to eat a pork chop and you ate a lamb chop, that still requires um, the slicha and kapara, because your intent is something that the Rebona Shalom takes seriously. The Gemara um, in Kedushin, and the Gemara quotes this um, Brita at the end, gives a very colorful case um, to, um, to elaborate on the theme. Rabbi Chia Barashi, number six. So Rabbi Chia Barashi, have a ragil kol idan dahave nafil la'ape. Whenever he said Tachanun in the morning, Have Amar, Harachaman Yatsilenu Hara. May God protect us from the Yetzer Hara. Um, as we're going to see in the story, um, the Yetzer Hara that he was referring to was were his sexual desires. Yomachad, one day, Shamatinu Debetu. His wife, he was davening at home, and his wife overheard his tefillah. And she said to herself, Amra, So it's a very interesting picture that the Murrah is uh, painting their domestic life. 
He's been, she says, you know, we have not had sexual relations se- for several years now. My Why is he saying She assumed until this point that the reason why they that he hadn't made advances was must have been because he had lost his sexual desire. But now, if that were the case, why is he saying Yatsilenu mi Yetzer Hara? There is no Yetzer Hara for um, him to be concerned about. Um, so the so she decided to take things into her own hands. Yomachada, over here in the second line, have a kagaris beginate. So he was sitting and learning in the garden. Kashta nafsha chalfa vitanya kame. So she dressed herself up. Apparently, she was a Rebbitzin, and maybe uh, if it's been several years, maybe an older Rebbitzin. She went and she didn't normally um, uh, put on makeup. She didn't normally uh, dress up. She um, put on a um, an outfit that was totally out of character for her. Amarla, Manat, to the extent that he didn't even recognize her. No, there's suddenly an attractive woman dressed provocatively passes by in his, his garden or right outside the garden, and he doesn't recognize that it's his own wife. Amra, and she wants to play the game. Maybe she thinks that he's playing a game. I don't know. But she says to him, Ana Haruta Dahadre Miyoma. So I'm Haruta. Haruta, the Mefarshim explained, was a, um, a well known, or in, in the neighborhood at least, a well known, a local prostitute. And she said, and I'm, you know, I'm on the way back from. Uh, the end of my day. Tava. So he propositioned her. Amrale. So she said to him, Aite nehale lahach romana deresh tsutsute. So please go climb the, the, the pomegranate tree in the garden um, and get me a pomegranate, a rimona, from the, the top of the tree. Shavar Azil Aitenehle. In other words, again, this elderly, I don't know how old, but certainly not a young man, the um, uh, rabbi, suddenly has a burst of energy, jumps up, climbs the tree, and gives her the uh, gives her the, the, the pomegranate. Um, and the Gemara doesn't say so explicitly. But presumably, one thing led to another at that point. Kiata libete. So now, later in the year, later in the day, right, this was in the garden. Maybe something happened in the garden itself. Kiata libete when um, she uh, when he came home. Have a kashagra de vito tanura salik vikayativ bigave. As he comes home now. His the the deed is done. Um, he doesn't know that it was with his wife, and he is trapped with remorse, um, and um, decides to uh, be, to sit in the oven. Uh, the the oven was is uh, is stoked, and he goes and he sits. He tries to go into the oven. Amrale. She says to him, "My high, right? As we, the this idea that what is going on with you now? As I said, it's not clear from the story whether she thinks that he really thought of her as a prostitute, or perhaps it's a some kind of um, of game that that he was playing, or that they were playing together. But she's totally shocked by his action. Amar la." So he says, this is what happened. Amrale, 
Oh, no, so he admits to her that he basically um, just uh, uh, betrayed her. Amrale, Ana Havai. What are you crazy? That was me. Lo Ashkachba. He refused to accept her um, argument that it was her, him, or her, excuse me. Adi Yahavale Simane. So she told him the whole story. She told him about the Ramon. She, you know, very similar to the, I guess, hearkening back to the Yehuda and Tamar story. Amrla, Ana Miha Li Isura Ichavne. So she, he said to her, no, it's not good enough because I know now I know it's true that you indeed were the person and I didn't do any Avera. But um, nevertheless, I intended to do an Avera. And if I intend on doing an Avera, that's bad enough. Kol yamav shalotot tzadik hayamit ane. So he from that that he uh, continued to have uh, to to fast ad shemet baotamita until he actually uh, died from um, from his fasting. Now I'm not sure. I have to be totally honest with you here that the um, is the Gemara criticizing him when he says that. First of all, calling him Otot Sadiq. After all, we know what occurred. And is it a so? Is it saying okay? It's he's really a Sadiq, and everybody will is uh, the, the it began with hara, right? So even though he was such a Sadiq, everyone has to be concerned about the Yitzhar Hara, and that's the if you will the the message of this particular story. Is there a little irony that's that's touching? Because after all, he mate beotam mitan. There's no happy ending here, so the it's not totally clear. You can be looking at it that the, the Gemara is speaking um, negatively of him. It could be that it's speaking positively of him. The uh, that ambivalence I think is important. However, then the Gemara says Ditanya isha hafiramba shemislachla. Then the the Gemara in Kedushin quotes that Brayta that we learned in number five, and says that indeed what Rabbi Akiva holds is true. In other words, now based on this quote, the Gemara seems to be saying that what he did was problematic in terms of the the need for kapara. So even though in the end of the day, it was his wife that he had slept with, but nevertheless he is still um, liable for the intent. And by extension, of course, we're all liable for our intent, even when we don't do an Avera. The, um, the Rambam follows this halacha, and he actually um, uh, legislates based on it. He says the following, Nadrava hafar lo ha'av, o habal, v'hi lo yada so if a if she made a neder and either her husband or her father, depending on the circumstances, um, annulled the vow, but she was unaware of that, Avral nidra, and she violated the vow o al shuata bezadon intentionally, harezo ptura, she is um, not liable for the the punishment of violating an oath. So even though she intended on doing an Isur, since ultimately she did not violate an Isur, so she is um, she is not held culpable. And that's what the Pasuk means by saying Hashem Islachla. However, just to uh, show that she's not this is not off the hook. Umakin ota makat mardut mipne she nitkavna li isur. There is a, a general punishment that we have of um, uh, when the when the avera is not actionable in terms of punishment. So the rabbis have a um, or the the court, I should say has a tool which it can use um, to enforce uh, various uh, halachot. Um, 
Makat, which is called Makat Mardut, the lashes of rebellion. Those lashes are not uh, punitive, but rather they are uh, preventative. Whereas if I want to, and that's why it's called Mardut, it's talking about something of a person who is rebellious. So the, the court can determine, well, is this a person who is, um, uh, is, is remorseful for their actions? Is this a person who is still, um, will, if another uh, circumstance along these lines will uh, occur, will that the person repeat the, uh, the Avera and determine, based on this, on a very subjective level, how many lashes to administer? They don't have to la- administer any lashes. They can administer more than the 40, which are the, the limit, 39, for punitive lashes. In other words, this is a, a tool that is given to Beitin back in the day when corporal punishment uh, was something that uh, was viewed as acceptable to, um, to enforce laws that do not necessarily have a, um, a punishment attached to it. So this is, so if the Rambam says that we would um, give her lashes for this action because so basically it's saying that we don't simply say the way that the, uh, going back to the Orachayim, that eno mitchayev klum, harehem pturim v'zakaim gam bidine shamayim. No, by no means. Here, the intent is something which um, is taken quite seriously. If a person has um, attempts to do an Avera, and for whatever the reason, uh, is unsuccessful in that attempt, nevertheless, you're going to be uh, you're going to be liable at least bidine shamayim, and therefore the court needs to give you um, the lashes, not so much, as I said, not so much as a punishment necessarily, but as a means to prevent future Averot or um, to, uh, to educate, if you will, uh, so that a future Averot would not occur. Um, the, um, the, the Grizz, um, the, uh, the Brisker Rav, Rav Elvel, Rav Chaim's son, uh, Rav Soloveitchik's uh, uncle. So in his um, commentary uh, to this uh, sugya in Nazir, he says the following, Umashma di'ilea katuv hava amina deloka. Were it not for the pasuk that says Hashem yislachla, I would have said that this is something which is liable for punishment. It was that she made a vow and she intentionally violated that vow so she should be, uh, she should receive malchot for it. The fact that it wasn't legally a vow at that point because of a, by dint of technicality, shouldn't play into it. And that's why the Pasuk has to say, no, we take into account, or the or Torah takes into account, whether on an objective level an Avera was accomplished, even if the person was in, in full intent to be over the Avera. So we have to say um, that if in this case where a person intended to eat a pork chop but ate a lamb chop instead, there is a, um, an act, a criminal act, but the, um, the Torah tells us that it's, um, it's, a, it's a criminal act which is not punished. So he takes this, um, you know, to compare it again to that Orachaim that we read um, at the beginning. He's taking it to the the opposite extreme. He's saying that basically, if I intend to do an isur, and only by virtue of a technicality, it's not an isur. That is still a maase isur. It's not that I'm being punished because of my machshava, or that I'm held culpable because of my machshava. My machshava turns my action into a uh, 
Um, but it's a very, which would mean that if he were to apply this to the brothers, I would think that he would say that with all due respect to what um, Yosef is telling them at the end, nevertheless, a, um, an Avera uh, took place, a Masa Isur took place. The, and we're going to see actually in, in, a, in, a, in a little bit, we'll see um, a, another Lithuanian Rav who says just that. Before we get to that though, let's take a look at a snippet of a tshuva of Rav Moshe Feinstein, number 10. The, um, uh, so in, in terms of a, the, um, the, the, it's a situation where a, um, uh, the, a, an act was done on Shabbat, and even though it would have been a malacha before the um, results of the malacha were finished, someone else stopped it. In other words, if I, um, if I, let's say, if I put up a pot of water to boil on Shabbat, so that is an avera of bishul of cooking on Shabbat. But if I put the water on the fire, and before it reached um, the boiling point. Um, I removed it. So I never actually cooked or someone else uh, uh, doing it. Um, the, uh, then we would, um, so then we have to take a look at it and say, one second, when I put it, uh, the, the pot on the, on the fire with full intent of allowing it to boil, and then something happened that it just, uh, it was removed from the fire before it reached the, the point of Bishul. What is that? Is that an Avera, not an Avera? So he says the following. So certainly you will have, uh, there is a, uh, you, or, or a culpability or the intent when you do the act. But we just simply say that the, um, the punishment is canceled here. So exactly the case that I just mentioned to you. That is that certainly at least in Shemayim, Bidei Shemayim, that is something which has uh, culpability um, with regard to and the that that. Uh, that case of the pork chop, lamb chop uh, metaphor he brings here as well. And he, then he explains, and There is a, we have to t- realize something. is, I can have intent to do an isur. Um, and I can have all of the evil intent in the world. But if I don't act upon that evil intent, so then it might be a character flaw, but it's not a ma'asa avera. He's trying to say that if I have intent to do something and I want to do an avera, so in effect, I have done a ma'asa avera and it's, it's something which is, there's culpability for and it's punishable. Hashem yislachla, God will forgive it, but it is something which is, from, from man's perspective, something which is very serious. So this is really very much in line with what the Brisker Rav had said, very much in line with um, that Rambam that talks about the, the Makat uh, Mardut. Um, the, um, we have a, uh, a similar case with regard to Shabbat um, where, the, uh, where the Rambam talks about the following case. Um, here in number eleven, that the um, the the situation is because I want to get into two test cases um, with the half hour that we have left. I'll just mention this uh, quickly. The the case that we're dealing with here is that um, a person is fishing on Shabbat, which is of course an avera, and he's using a net to haul the fish um, out of the water, um, and when he throws his net in. Um, the, the, the following scenario. I'll just take the last line. It kaven lahalot dagim veheelad dagim vitinok patur. So the person throws in his net attempting to fish. He doesn't know that 
um, off the dock, excuse me, off the dock, a, um, a child has fallen off the dock on the other side. And when he hauls up his fish, he hauls up a, um, a child who was drowning at the same time. So he is not going to be punished for fishing, even if he had no idea when he was throwing in his net or pulling up the net that there was a pikuach nefesh situation. Now, the previous line, the Rambam said that, of course, if that's what he's doing, he's saying, okay, I'm going to haul in the kid and if I get some fish at the same time, great. So then, then you're patur because your primary intent was to save the child. But here, even though you have no intent on saving the child, nevertheless, we look at the um, result of the action, um, which was, of course, not only permissible, but commanded. And so therefore, we um, he is not held liable for for fishing either. On this halacha, so um, Mayor Simcha of the Vins, the, uh, the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, so he comments on this Rambam and he says, Aval makin oto mardut. You know, he'll get his medal for, you know, it'll be a, a situation, he'll be written up in the paper the next day about how he saved the, uh, the child, and then Beitin will haul him off and give him lashes because this is exactly the same scenario that we spoke about before. He intended to do the Avera. He got lucky and didn't do the Avera. Um, but that doesn't mean that there isn't liability, um, certainly Bidei Shamayim, and that's reflected in Beitin by the, um, by the lashes of Makat Mardut. Two cases. Um, and let's try to, to see the, the cases. Um, here's the case. Kemase Shahaya, this is in the, um, uh, the in Vilna, in the time it's under uh, Russian rule. And the um, and here we have the following uh, scenario. Mase Shahaya bekvar echad, shedar sham ish echad, vahaya machzik beseter yash limkor keneged achok. So in this village, there was a person who had a, an illegal uh, distillery and he had bootleg liquor, um, and he, uh, which, he, which he sold um, against the law. Fire water, um, whiskey, shemocher. Azai chuet hayash, v'od yishalem kesef onish kachok. Words basically, the fact that there was bootlegging going on was known the, to the authorities. Um, they would uh, occasionally have uh, uh, raids, uh, in which case that they would uh, confiscate the uh, the goods as well as um, applying a a fine. So one time a person came person's distillery. So they had some, it seems as though it wasn't even in, uh, unintentional, that there was some kind of disagreement that they had. He took the, the, the bottle, he smashed it, and um, basically destroyed the, um, the liquor. And while this is still playing out. Pitom bau mimuneya melech vichipsu velo matzo. So they, the, the authorities come in looking for the liquor, but there's no liquor to be found because this other guy had just destroyed the, uh, the goods. Vinitzel al yideha nezek mi onesh rab. So now, because by a fluke, this person who had damaged his property and was should have been held liable now is has done him a great favor so 
So now the owner, the bootlegger says, well, okay, that's really very nice, but I'm taking you to court for the, or bait in, for the damage that you did to my property. So does he have to pay or, or not? So here's the, um, uh, the answer. So you shouldn't have to pay because after all, he has now done him a, um, a great favor. Right, so this is the Gemara that the Rambam that we spoke about um, a few moments ago was basing himself on that the, um, we follow a person's actions and not the intent. Um, and the Upasaka Rambam Vecholo Poskim Kiraba de Patur. So the Rambam and all of the other um, poskim follow this idea that, uh, that, that it's patur because of the, that we follow the, the, the bottom line action as opposed to, and consequences of the action, as opposed to his um, intent. Um, and the, um, um, the so, uh, so therefore he uh, is not um, held culpable. Um, the um, he, perhaps he would disagree with what the or Sameach said a little bit later, saying that he was uh, has to get that he is liable for makam. He says, <laughs> So he quotes the case of the Basar Chazir, which we won't read again inside. We've read it, uh, t- talked about it about eight times already, but he says it's the same type of scenario again. That he is um, he is um, patur from onish bide adam af bidine shamayim hu chayav. So he is, however, culpable um, in uh, heaven. And now this is why I brought this because of the um, talking to because he brings um, Yosef into the picture. Okay, the, because this is a, a picture, I can't highlight it. I apologize. So he says, I'm going to show, prove it from the case of Yosef. The brothers had full intent to harm Yosef. Yosef, It's not for me to punish you. Since ultimately only good came from your actions. So this is something which is not in the pasuk. This right, this line right here. Okay, the second line from the bottom. That which is so critical. I wish I could highlight it. Rak shamayim atem chayavim. You are indeed. Yosef is telling his brothers, "You're off the hook here, and I forgive you, but you still have to answer to God." ein shayachli. But that's not my problem. Ki hatachat elokim anochi. I am, am I instead of God? I'm not instead of God. God will punish you or not punish you. He's the scorekeeper in the sky. I'm not the scorekeeper. You have to work out with him your um, culpability. So, the um, uh, so uh, the Mokor Chayim um, here comes up with the final the final analysis is that if I harm another individual and um, and but in the larger picture it turns out 
that it was a favor for him. It was something that he benefited from. So I'm patur midine adam. I have no um, culpability in this world, but chayav midine shamayim. God uh, may still hold me accountable for my actions and for my intent. So in the particular case here of the uh, the bootlegger, so he says that the uh, the person who damaged the goods doesn't have to pay compensation, but he very well might be um, chayav. His bill might still exist in uh, Shammai. The um, this idea, though, this application was not at all uh, something that was uh, accepted. So a contemporary, um, also in Vilna, apparently. Case came to to the bait in there, so the uh, Rav Shlomo Cohen in the Binyan Shlomo disagrees. He says, "Gam ma shekatav de mikom a kom b'dinah shemayim uchayav mimashu muchazal al krad di isha feram b'ashem yislachla." So now he makes a very important distinction. He says the following: He ne lefi ma shekatav di yesh lachalek ben mazik l'shar isurin. The um. To, to talk about as the Makor Chaim did with regard to um, the uh, a, a case where damage was being done to the um, uh, uh, to the to the party the um, is a is mixing apples and oranges because the case where um, the Gemara was talking about the case where the Gemara was talking about was with regard to a situation where it was an Aveira ben Adam Lamakom. It was I want to eat treif. I want to eat a pork chop. But I I don't eat the pork chop because I thought it was a pork chop, but in reality it was a lamb chop. Okay. But if I'm talking about a situation of Ben Adam Lichavero, so the the crime was done. The um, the, 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 the liquor was destroyed. The fact that afterwards there happens to be a positive um, result that stems from my negative action, that doesn't absolve me from my responsibility for my actions. I never ate the pork chop. I wanted to eat a pork chop, but I never actually ate it. Here, I actually damaged another person's property. So therefore, he says that I have to pay for that. And then he takes the, him to task with regard to the situation of Yosef. And I think that this is what um, uh, I think it was Charles who put a comment on earlier. Um, and uh, basically, um, so he, he would agree with um, the, the Binyan Shlomo. He says the following. Um, that Uma Shevi Raya, the Bidine Shamayim Chayav, Mehad Amar Yosef Lechab Atach the Lokim Anochi, Lefiani Adati Eno Raya Shoklum. This is a terrible proof. Why? He says the following Hagaba at Smecha. Let's think this through a little bit. Im Adam Ganab Nefesh, if a person kidnapped another person, Umicharo. And he sold him into slavery. Vehitrubo, ad ve'ad shalishab, and he was warned, and he was now, in other words, the the criminal was someone who we would bring to court, and the death penalty would apply to him because that is, after all, the 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 penalty for uh, for kidnapping and selling another individual. Ve'ad lishabo edim lebeitin. So until the court case was complete, um, right, I sold a person into slavery and the Yosef story happens. Before I get, I'm, I'm taken to court. Would anyone think for a moment that just because in some way this has played out for the benefit of the uh, of the victim, that 
the uh, the kidnapper would not be held accountable for his actions, of course he would be punished. So whenever you're talking about a situation where the the crime is accomplished, so then the, and specifically, um, so maybe he won't make the distinction I made between Ben Adam Lechavero and Ben Adam Lemakom. But the um, but the, the more important distinction he might say is whether or not the action occurred and there were positive uh, repercussions or that the action never occurred. Um, I think that in the Ben Adam the Makom case, it happens perhaps more easily in that uh, in that way. But be that as it may, so if you did the if you did the crime, so then you are held accountable. So the um, everything that we said at the beginning of this year, right? We would have to now, at least according to this, if you will, um, this halachic analysis, we would have to take a look at the Yosef situation um, very differently. Um, and in fact, how he understands the Yosef situation, why were they not held accountable? So he says, is because So um, I guess this touches upon the, the topic that I wanted to speak about today, as I told you at the beginning of this year, and we'll get to it sometime, Bizrat Hashem. But the this idea is that they they weren't held accountable simply because the law hadn't been legislated yet. Had there been a law of um, of uh, of gnevat nefesh of kidnapping, which was a uh, a capital crime, had that uh, had that halacha applied, so then they would have been um, accountable and they would have had to uh, they would have been punished in a beitin for what they did. It is a 180 degree difference between this and what the Or Chaim wrote. Was the idea that you are definitely held accountable. And now I would look at the, the Yosef story very differently. I would say that what Yosef is telling them is, of course, you're, what you did was a terrible, terrible thing. Um, and, you, um, and you have to be looking at yourselves in, in the mirror. Maybe Yosef himself wasn't saying that because Yosef, as I said, wanted to have a reconciliation with his brothers. Um, and remember, it's 17 years later. Um, and if the brothers are still thinking this way, it points to a rift between Yosef and his brothers that perhaps never was totally healed. Um, that if they're still afraid that he's going to um, he, he's going to take revenge now that Yaakov has passed away, who knows if that rift ever is healed 100 But Yosef wants to reconcile with his brothers. He wants to be forgiving to his brothers. But it doesn't mean that legally they are not culpable. That certainly the uh, seems to be the uh, the approach of uh, Rav Shlomo Cohen. Um, another uh, in the ten minutes that we have left, let's take a look at a um, another test case for this uh, question. Um, we'll call it the, the sting. Okay, if you have a sting operation. Um, is that something which is um, allowed um, uh, halachically? The, um, the case is the following. Um, we'll look at number 18. Shala echad, sheyesh lo misharet ben vayit bebeito. So we have a, a person, this is uh, the Ben Yishchai in his tshuva Torah Lishma, um, Baghdad, so you're dealing with a person um, in the late 19th century in Baghdad, a presumably a, um, a somewhat wealthy individual, and he has a servant. And he wants to uh, test um, his uh, servant's uh, loyalty. He wants to test his um, honesty. So he sets a trap and he wants to know, or he, he's asking if he's allowed to set the trap. He wants to leave some uh, money 
lying around one of the rooms in a way that it would be seem pretty clearly that it was not intentionally left there and that the um, and that the balabai doesn't know um, that the money is there and if someone were to steal the money he um, would be able to get away with it um, the um, and now he'll leave the money there so then he'll see how honest this um, this servant in is. Um, so are you allowed um, to do this? Similarly, is the chenis tapaknu im shari l'nasot et misharto or et bino bidvar erva. So the uh, uh, We've had situations like this where the question is, we're, we're going to set up a person um, uh, with sexual interest, right? the, the so-called honey trap. Is that a, um, is that halakhali permissible? Ladat imit kifo yitzro la'asot isur al yidei hamza'a sh'yaseh lo gamken l'nisayon al dilma da'asur l'nasot b'zeh mishum l'fnei iver d'dilma yechta. It basically is entrapment um, something which is halachically um, asur. So the um, the Ben Ishchai's response is nisyonot keile asur la asot ki shema ze yavor viyechta v'nimtzes over al lifnei iver lo titen michshol ki hu heviyoli de michshol al yidei hamtzaot shasalo. So he says. That this that the uh, the isur of lifnei iver lo titen michshol of not placing a literally placing a stumbling block before a blind person that uh, and which also includes a situation where I um, where the uh, Chazal understood it to to mean where I um, aid and abet another individual's uh, doing uh, an avera. So that would fall into this category. So he says, one second, you know, this may not be a, we might not be able to get away with this with regard to the, um, in terms of the sexual entrapment, but with regard to the financial entrapment, there is a major loophole. In other words, I'm now a, I've just given this year, I'm familiar with the various halachic uh, uh, permutations. So what I'm going to do is the following. I will, I will gift him this money. So that way, if he should um, steal it, he's stealing his own money. I'm doing this, I'm gifting it to him before I um, leave the, the money out. So it's really his money that he's taking, but of course I can test his honesty because he doesn't know that I have gifted him the money. This is the same scenario in effect as the situation where the woman violates the vow when she doesn't know that the vow itself has already been annulled. Um, so so he says, no, this is not the case. So he is doing an iser. So it's very similar to what the um, what the briskarov said with regard to the the case that it's a masa avera. And if it was still a, if, if I can't uh, entrap to do an Avera because of Lifnei Iver. So this is also considered a Maase Avera, as long as the person who is um, doing the action is, of, is under the impression that he's doing an Avera, it's entrapment um, and it's Lifnei Iver if I cause that uh, to happen. So the, um, so therefore, the uh, uh, he forbids it. Um, the um, this question is ra was raised other, by other people as well um, at different times. Um, so here are the you know, 
well as with the way that um, the uh, the Sri Day uh, Aish looked at it and how the uh, Minchat Shlomo or Shlomo um, understood it. So the um, so th there is a bit of a twist here because he says um, the Sri Day Aish says that the uh, uh, he actually allows for this. Uh, the case here is a little more, um, uh, well, it's it's basically the same thing. It's a little more sophisticated. It's dealing with a, a an assistant in the office who is responsible for accounts. And you're, able to, he's able, you're able to set up a situation where if he wants to embezzle funds, he's able to. Is this something which is, again, permissible um, to do or not to, to see if he will fall into the trap? So he says, Virali lahatir. Right? So the Sri Deesh says that this is permissible. Apima um, Shikatava Ridvala Bodazara, based on a uh, another case, because I'm not going to read the case because of the, we only have uh, two minutes left. The, however, the, the the bottom line is what's important to me here. So it's a, an interesting uh, way to do lifne um, iver. Uh, words, he's saying that if I have a uh, when is it lifne iver? If I give you something which is forbidden um, to eat, um, and um, I know that you're going to to eat it. That that's forbidden. However, in this situation, I'm not um, giving you anything. You're taking it. Because I left something in my. It's perfectly legitimate for me to to go back to this uh, the Benny Shchai's case. It's perfectly legitimate for me to leave money around my own home. Um, you have to make a decision whether you're going to take something. Not as though I handed you something and I said, "Here, take this." I am leaving something in my home, and you have to determine whether you're going to be a thief. Knowing full well what the uh, moral, moral uh, ramifications are, so you're a moral agent, and when you're a moral agent, an independent moral agent, the person who sets the trap is not over the issue of lifne iver. Because he continues, I can um, legitimately um, say that um, judge you favorably. You know, I, if I'm testing someone, um, I'm hoping, maybe not more than hoping, I'm expecting the person to pass the test. So if he fails the test, that was his choice. And I shouldn't be chayav for. Um, uh, I shouldn't be high for the uh, for the avera. Was he very well might, um, and may, now we have to uh, try to uh, um, perhaps make uh, distinctions. Right? Uh, in the case of the, uh, the sexual entrapment, um, there it's a um, where there the, the situation is one where he is actually being um, actively tempted. To, um, uh, to do an Avera. Here, it's something which is much more neutral. Right? There are all, all, so all sorts of other circumstances where a person can steal. Um, you know, if you're dealing with a household servant or if you're dealing with a, um, a, a, an assistant in the office, there are all ways, with, without me setting up a trap at all, there are ways for people to embezzle funds People, there's white collar crime all the time. Um, so there isn't any reason to assume that what I'm doing is more of a, a um, it's, I'm doing this intentionally, but it's not more of an Avera as a result. Rosh Zalman in the Mincha Shlomo disagrees. And with this, we'll, we'll close. Um, so he says uh, the following. He says, this is still considered to be, because the, 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 the comparison was with regard 
to um, the halacha of a uh, of an oath. If I there are certain circumstances where if I know if I've uh, let's say um, lent someone money if I'm loaned him the money um, and he denies um, that I uh, lent him the fund or he doesn't accept uh, responsibility for the full sum. I say that it was a loan for uh, for a thousand. He claims that I only lent him five hundred, um, and there are no witnesses. It was done something which was, uh, you know, totally um, as a um, uh, as a, a friendly gesture, without any witnesses. Um, so I can take him to Beitin, and Beitin has no way of proving it one way or the other. But because it's modem b'mikza, so then. That is a where he's admitted to part of the uh, the debt, so Beitin will um, tell him to take an oath. Um, now, that's exactly the same situation in effect because we're tempting him to lie in court. We're hoping that he won't lie, or perhaps the creditor um, is the one who's lying. Beitin doesn't know, but the creditor and the debtor they both know who is telling the. If I, the creditor, bring him now to Beitin, I know that I lent him a thousand, uh, a thousand shekel, and I'm going to cause him to take an oath. So why isn't that lifnei iver? So he says that this isn't lifnei iver because It's a very um, it's a very hard line to draw. But the the Swedish, um, his uh, line is a is a sharper line. The 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 Minchat Shlomo, um, Shlomo Zaman is um, drawing a fuzzier line. He's saying this is a actual entrapment, um, and that becomes um, an avera um, where the oath is less direct. Um, in the end. Uh, as part of the murkiness, the moral murkiness here, there is a, a bit of a problem because you know the, we can look at the person, the the person who's setting the trap, who's setting the sting. He is, you know, we can look at him as being basically a something morally problematic than what he's doing. On the other hand, we can um, there is another, there's a flip side. Because if I have my suspicions about the honesty of this employee, and I don't have the means to um, to test him, so I may very well um, decide to fire him. Because the grounds that I have is that th- things have disappeared in the house, and I think that he's the one who's um, he was the last one seen in that room, or whatever it is. I suspect. If I don't have any means to um, to test him, I might just fire him. So he says. So he says. Then AFLP leaves it an open question. And any choshev shetov lifater otam meha'avoda mipnei achashad measher levarer al yedei a pitayon v'tzarich iyun. Right. So he says. In the, in the end result, um, if the um, if the alternative. Is that the employer is going to fire the employee? Well, then maybe it's better to have the the sting operation. Whereas we we have to take a look at the at a full picture. It's a very, um, as I said, it's a murky type of situation. And in these type of situations, sometimes there isn't a, a totally clear answer as how to go about it. Just to go back to the beginning of this year, again, when we come to Yosef, when it's a very clear cut of a ra that the brothers are doing. So we can look at it from a halachic perspective. I think that the halachically we would hold the, the brothers, what Shlomo Cohen said, we would hold the brothers very much accountable for their actions. Um, the fact that something happened afterwards, which is um, which was to the benefit of all, um, notwithstanding. However, having said that, the it's I find it very interesting that the Mufarshim don't seem to, most of the Mufarshim at least, don't seem to go down that path. The Mufarshim, um, the, the most radical, as I said, was the Urachayim that said that, it, you know, it's, the intent is not 
what is at uh, play. Um, that is, we're not going to, to hold it, and we're going to look at the final result to determine what the um, what uh, the culpability is. Um, and the um, uh, but the, the others, whether it's the Rashbam, the Svorno, etc. So they are perhaps they're introducing those other um, calculations, whether it's God who forced their hand in this case, going to the Rashbam, which is really, really, very, really radical um, statement in its own right, or the Sforno who's saying that they were justified based on their own calculations. Perhaps they're introducing those factors because if those factors aren't introduced, they can't accept the Orchaim's uh, uh, interpretation. Then they would have to view this the way that we saw with um, uh, Rav Shlomo Cohen in his uh, analysis of the bootleggers case, that um, the brothers indeed would be have held been held accountable not only bidei shemayim but even bidei adam. Okay, so I want to thank everyone. It was uh, uh, good to see everyone um, again. It's been a few weeks um, since uh, since I gave the shear. Look forward to uh, the next time. Can you do anything about the sound? Yes. Okay, I was un I was not under the impression that there was a problem with the sound. I thought it had been uh, taken care of when I was holding this microphone to my uh, to my face the whole year. <laughs>